All right, here's a little tribute to the kids in my hometown of James Island that I grew up with, a little place in Charleston, South Carolina. The music is courtesy of Stoy Prelo, who you'll be hearing a lot from in this episode. This intro, by the way, is approved by my two African-American friends who I'll be sharing this episode with. So I didn't know it was a blessing at the time, and I wouldn't know until years later, but one Sunday afternoon, my dad decided we're not Catholic anymore. Well, my parents would take us out of the Catholic church and school we were growing up in, put us in public schools. I cried. I was crushed, but it's because I had a crush. (laughs) I was a crusher back in the day. I was crying about the girl, not everybody else. Back when you're young, you get over it quickly. I think it's science. The younger you are, the quicker it takes to get over. I mean, have you seen one of your grandparents lose their spouse after 60 years, man? They never get over. So yeah, three weeks later, I was fine. Different crush. A public school girl. Oh, yeah, but shout out to Nativity Catholic Church. My first best friend, Eddie Defreno. Hell yeah. I wonder if Sister Carol Ann is alive. I know Sister Angela. No way in hell that dear woman is alive. <laughs> Unless she was in the Green Mile with Tom Hanks and that little mouse, Mr. Jangles. <laughs> so. If y'all don't know my heart by now and how I feel about racial diversity, you're a new listener. So give me some grace here and how I talk. It's mostly fam I'm talking to and they're used to me. So black people were extremely rare at my Catholic school, like three max. I could tell you their names today. But if I recall correctly, the years I was there, all three of these kids in my grade, they were never in homeroom altogether. And homeroom is where your ass stayed all day. So I was thinking about this. Perhaps it happened in later grades when I had moved on from the Catholic Church, but I just never thought it possible to really see and learn black people's culture. I mean, how intimidating would it be to be such a minority and assert blackness of any kind at such a young age and teachers aren't going to do it? So to me, and maybe I'm the only one because black people were such a rarity in my world, I was in awe. Like a real black person. Like I'm kind of being silly right now, but I'm seriously not exaggerating much. So when we went to public school, we're talking 40 percent black, maybe more. And I was thrusted into black culture, even if it was from just observation. But my brother and I eventually got to a point in which we hung out with our black friends as much as our white friends, usually all together. Now, I'd say these friendships helped with familiarity enough to the point where I know consciously there were differences between us. It just didn't matter at all, like not a bit. I count these friendships as a great blessing, but when I really think about it, I never really got to understand black people past a surface level after nine years of public school. I had zero clue what the world was like through their eyes. And you know what? We talked as kids about more important things like who knows how to beat Super Mario Brothers 3. I mean, we don't have time for conversations about race stuff. That's boring. Let's go back to the court. And by the way, give me back my now and later. And that's why this episode is special to me. We 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 shared our childhoods with one another. I mean, hell, I remember young Stoy's kindness to me when I was fresh in public school, fourth grade, man. And I'll tell you the truth. I was so overwhelmed with black people names. It wasn't until Christmas I knew what the hell black folks were even calling (laughs) Stoy. (laughs) I didn't know what his name was. I didn't know what they were saying. And I don't think I was alone amongst my white brothers and sisters. So guys, you got to realize we're appearing on our screen. We haven't seen one another since 1995, man. So this is also a special episode because my suspicion was correct. And I'm going to tell you, I could talk about this stuff with these guys forever. The sorts of things black kids joked about when it was just them, uh, who they assume my dad was when they saw him with my mom. And what I saw as middle class, they saw as rich. So thanks for listening. We got a lot of things going on with this podcast, ways you can support. See the show notes or listen to the beginning of another episode because I don't want to do that right now. So Stoy Prelo and Antonio Hype Seabrook. And by the way, you don't get any more Charleston than those two last names. Bruised and beaten and we're weakened but some of us is breathing steady achieving leaving this place trying to make a difference so we fight for connections through the social distance uh, despite admittance from the opposition Google Maps, we got a pin drop on a position. I say nowhere to hide. Thank you.
legit one of the most excited I have been in a really long time, if not the most excited, <laughs> because I have literally not seen these guys' faces. I mean, like they yeah. pop on the screen and it's nothing but grinning from ear to ear. Cause I'm like, yeah. I can't believe I'm yeah, sitting man. here with Stoy and Hype. <laughs> How are y'all, man? Good, man. Good, man. Good, good to go. Do you still go I- by Hype? <laughs> It's funny you say that because when I go home, the people that you know in our generation, they still call me that. <laughs> so I got Google. I programmed Google to say, I say, "Hey Google, I'm home." And Google be like, "Hey, hype, welcome home." Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so we still know you as hype. You know what I mean? But it sounds yeah. like you telling Google to call you hype. You like it too? <laughs> yeah, man. Y'all give me that so- name for life. Yeah, uh, I'm going to pick up this yearbook. Antonio, I don't know if, if you remember this, because Stoy actually said that a lot of his memories are gone, but you and I were pretty much inseparable in the seventh grade. And I don't know. Oh, yeah, if, man. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you remember when we used to talk, try to talk this way, but here's the seventh grade yearbook, and it says, to Joey, my, my, bestest, bestest, friend, friend, in, in, the, the, whole, whole world. <laughs> hype, hype. <laughs> <laughs> we used to try to carry on conversations like that all the time. Yeah, yeah. You still, wow, you still remember that. <laughs> oh, for sure. But do you guys remember our eighth grade basketball season? Listen, y'all don't understand how connected I am to that eighth grade team. Like, that was my glory years. Like, I, I remember yeah. scoring, like, 29 points one game. And so I will I hold on to it. To them years uh, yeah. a lot. Yeah. So man. so I don't know if y'all knew knew this inside joke that was going on behind the scenes. There was one guy that that caught us and he just smiled because he knew we were joking around. But me and the four other white guys on the team, Derek, John, Paul, and Chris, I think, we we <laughs> would call ourselves the WBs. Like we were the white boys and and we are hardly gonna get any play time and we know this. Like before the game started, just to make ourselves laugh, we would huddle up and we'd be like, hey, you know they're depending on us. Like it makes or breaks on us. Like we swept the Christmas tournament, the regular season, mm-hmm. and then yeah. we almost swept the last tournament and we legit got ripped off. Legit. Yeah, Nativity cheated off. us, man. Nativity. Yeah. yeah. With Kevin. Yeah. I think I remember yep. that dude, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember him too because he was bull legged. He walked kind of funny. Kind of bent yeah. over, you know. Yeah. Look at the dude hard that blew a fire. It's like, yo, foul, you ain't touch foul, this man. Foul. All right, little editorial note. I couldn't let it slide. These guys are talking about seventh grade basketball. I was talking about eighth grade basketball, and I just had to get it out there. Nativity was no match for us. Not that eighth grade team. We swept the Christmas tournament, we swept the regular season, we almost swept the last tournament, but Porter Goud was no match for us, except with the referee. The referee in Porter Goud was too much for us to handle. Just had to get that out there. <laughs> Hi, do you remember Stoy's excited high-pitched scream? <laughs> yeah. like, I, I remember those times when Coach Wright he would be like, no, Stoy, no, because he'd be going up for a three, and Stoy would just shoot it anyway and go in, yeah. and then he'd do his loud high-pitched like- scream. Hey, I still do that. I promise you. I still, when I get excited, that yeah. voice get high, man. And it's, it's still the same way. I think it was the seventh grade. It, it 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 almost feels like a comedy because we had a new assistant principal, Mr. Melton. Nerd- Mr. Melton. Mr. Melton. Mr. Melton. Yes. You and remember so the introductory? That was about to talk about that to introductory. The microphone. And he's like, "Hello, hold on, my hold name is." Yeah. Hold on, wait, everybody went crazy. It, it was the build up because they was like, "Oh, we got this new military guy. Oh, he doesn't." Yeah, play he's games. he's gonna get oh, on everybody. So so you're expecting to see like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something come out there, man. <laughs> we weren't really rude kids. It was real no. laughter. Like it was yeah. this, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. And then he tried to reel it back in with that same voice. He was like, God, be quick. And then just... about, good morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? <laughs> and you did y'all have the best crazy, impersonation man. of him. Right, I don't so... know how y'all remember these stuff, man. Oh, oh, All right, so man. I remember it now when you're saying it, but right. that yeah. stuff has 
right. gone for right. my that was that was one of the funniest especially yeah. like that time, that's one of the funniest things i had ever seen at that point <laughs> they done had us so they done had us scared yeah. up yeah. yeah man they had us scared up like oh this guy's <laughs> gonna come in and he's gonna be and you guys are better straighten up yep. we had to deal with him the whole summer so we thinking <laughs> we ain't seen a man yet or nothing so we thinking yeah. you know it's gonna be some big commando Mr. looking Milton. dude mr milton <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on, I remember, last, man. Last two <laughs> is legit the funniest thing that everybody anybody has ever said in class, and the other one oh, as an as an I adult, <laughs> the other one as an adult, I look back on and I realize the mistake that our teacher made. It was completely yeah, innocent, but as she kids, oh, yeah, as yeah. kids, we were like, "What the hell did you just say to him? Do you remember your haircut?" I had a ball, almost a ball head. And yes. she said, what happened? Did your team lose yes. or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so every story, everybody, it's like all of a sudden we lost faith in adults. We are like, how could you put yeah. on this man? Now I look back and it yeah. was a big blunder on her part. She was actually like, yeah. hey, what's going on? Like almost like the kids yeah. are making fun of you. Do you remember what you said to her? Gosh, why your nose so big? <laughs> 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 I, you didn't say that. He yeah, did. she said, "Can I hey. ask? Can I ask? Can I ask why you? Why, why you? What happened to your hair? Can I ask you uh, what happened? Did your team lose or something?" <laughs> Everybody was like, "Oh, like oh, for real." And I looked right at her. That was mistake. I looked her right in the face and I said, "Can I ask why your nose so big?" <laughs> Because remember, she had that big point. You know? Yeah. Yep. She realized she had made a mistake, and she didn't even get you in trouble for that because she was just like, yeah. I actually did cross a line. Here's yeah. my favorite thing that anybody's ever said in class. So we had just learned a new word in Mr. Brown's class. So this is junior year. You and I weren't as close as we were, but we had just right. learned this new word, and you guys were talking, carry on. Mr. Brown is always just like, you guys need to stop and pay attention, and I've had enough of this. And he went on this tirade, and we had just learned a word hype you stand up and you're like mr brown we get it what you trying to do filibuster (laughs) (laughs) i I didn't know you were like that in class yeah man if i if i could get away with it because i i wouldn't you know i ain't been type you just want to get in trouble if i think yeah i I know that's what i'm saying (laughs) and mr brown was kind of cool now with miss I did that because she had me be mad because she tried to, I thought she tried to embarrass me. So yeah. that was just yeah. like, ah, right back at you. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I remember yeah. how we used to clown her about that nose. She had that big pointy nose. We used to yeah. always, yeah. that was like the little she joke look, behind her back. She looked like that, um, that dude in um, Despicable, Despicable Me. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I remember her. Not, not, I just yeah. remember that real sharp nose. Yeah, with the little boy uh, haircut and the glasses. <laughs> watch me get an email, someone saying, why y'all talking about my mom for like that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what has brought this conversation on, I have had some friends recently who have basically helped me way too late in my adulthood. That's, that's a, that's a knock on me. I I get it a little bit more. I would say I get it a lot more, but still learning. I had super close friends like you guys in our neighborhood. So kids we played with all the time, Wally, Cromwell, Clyde and Clark. Yeah. 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 So I just seriously was operating with this assumption that all of our childhoods are are pretty much the same. Now, I realize that white culture and black culture consistently had major differences. But as far as my childhood experience and y'all's childhood experience, I just assumed we were all good. Now, I'm going to tell you two different situations that because I was really thinking back on 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 my life and my interactions. And there's there's two situations that I can think of now. Pretty racist situation that two of my friends were in. One of them was just absolutely shocking because because, again, all we're doing is playing ball, trying to beat Mike Tyson and 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 beat Super Mario Brothers. Uh, you know, I mean, we're mm-hmm. just having fun eating Chico sticks right. and Mountain Laters. Like, that is summertime. Yeah. Chili Bears, all that stuff. So, uh, Chili Bears. Uh, was, yeah, <laughs> Chili <baby>. Bear, boy. <laughs> That's only James Allen. That's, That's only right. James That's Allen. Right. That's right. I'm telling you. 
So I throw some names out there. He graduated my brother, Kelly Grant. He was over in our backyard and he had brought some of his cousins, siblings, a bunch of kids I had never met before. And I think they were all younger. And so my mom made some homemade chili bears, basically for our listeners, it's Kool-Aid frozen in a cup. And so I told everybody, I was just like, man, listen, there's like chili bears coming out. And one of Kelly's younger cousins or siblings froze his whole demeanor went fearful and he said his his parents racist and i i didn't know if he was kidding i like looked and kelly's reaction he hit him in the back of the head he's like no they're not racist but the look of fear on his face was legit as a child i just go about my business i kind of forget about that but now as an adult, I'm like, that was legit fear. There was something connected to that. And then one more, and this one actually does hurt my heart when I think about it, because I just, it just, the dots weren't connecting then. But Wally Cromwell, who we were very close to, we were basically, me, my brother, and another guy were in this other guy's pool. And we were all white and we're all in the pool. And our friend basically says, mom said only three people in the pool at a time. Well, I know damn well there's been more than three people in the pool at a time. Well, Wally is on the outside of the fence on a hot summer day, probably 12 years old, sad and watching us. And I, in, in my head, because my mom is very similar to that as far as just two people in the house, you know, just three people. So I was just like, okay, I guess it's just three people in the pool. But now looking back, I realize I'm pretty sure that family would not want a black person swimming in their pool. And I won't go into how and why I know that, but it's just so mm -hmm. crazy because now all three of us, if that happened to someone of another color, we'd get out of the pool and say, OK, well, this is this is messed up. But yeah. so all of this just started to get me wondering about the three of us growing up on James Island and potentially having completely different experiences. And, and, and that may, that may be the case. It may not be the case. That's kind of what I want to investigate. But I mean, I guess just starting with out in the neighborhoods, out on Folly Road, was there a difference in how cops treated you guys? Do you think teachers in general? Like, I don't, I just assumed all the teachers were good guys and good ladies. I, you know, I didn't assume any of them were racist. Like what were y'all's experience? I know that's a very broad uh, place to start. But. I can't really say because I had blinders on as a child too. A lot of things that are in Charleston that I might have been around or seen or whatever and didn't realize like dang, that's where that came from, huh? You know, so, but as far as like experiences, there wasn't, I, and I could have been missing them, you know what I'm saying? I remember one time there was, uh, I ain't gonna name the name, but it was a girl in the class. <laughs> she liked me, I like her. So I got her number and um, I called her. It was funny because when I called her, right, she was like, you know, OK, so we we high school, you know, like ninth grade, whatever. You know how it's still not girls aren't really allowed to use the phone like that. You know what I'm saying? They can't have guys call the house. You know how that was back then. It's not right. not every girl right. can have, you know, so right. I could tell she kept checking, trying to be like sneaky on the phone or whatever. But I ain't think nothing of it because I had done talk to other girls and it was like that. So. Finally, she just put the phone down, and I just heard her talking in the background. I couldn't make out what they were saying. I wasn't trying to, and she hung the phone up for no reason. I was like, all right. So I didn't call back because I'm like, well, it sounded like she's probably busy. So the next day, and the reason why I knew she liked me because her, her other friends had told me that. And I kind of had an idea, but I wasn't sure. Right. But anyway, so I got her number, and I called her, and then I came back to school the next day. And I told the friends, I was like, yeah, so I called her last night. And they're like, you did what? I said, I got her number, and I called her. And it was like, you called her. And I'm like, yeah. And they pulled me to the side. And it was like, don't ever do that, man. Do you remember, who those, were, do you remember, who, remember who, who those guys were, though? Do you remember who those guys were, though? Yeah, I remember who those guys were. And yeah. Yeah. it was like, yeah. don't ever do that, man. Her, her dad is racist. You know, and I was like, what? It's like big, way out there, like super, super racist. And I was like, for real? They was like, yeah, like she ain't not going to tell you that. And I was like, oh, all right. You know, because that's obviously she ain't going to just say, hey. My dad is a racist. You know what I'm saying? Right. So they were like, yeah, don't, don't, right. don't do that. So I was like, cool. I didn't take it out on her. We still was cool. I just didn't ever call her house anymore. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> right. 
I mean that that right there. That's interesting to me because and and maybe somewhere in Alabama or or maybe somewhere in Charleston. But my kids and their circle of friends, which which there's diversity in their schools. I don't think there's anyone known as the racist dad and gets away with it or or is accepted like you guys as as black young men heard and had to process in your head that there was a, a girl's dad that goes to your school that does not like y'all for your skin color. Right. Like you guys had to. Pro- that's for me. I, I mean, I had a couple of experiences, um, but as far as dealing with the cops, majority yeah. of the cops where we from were black. So mm-hmm. um, I even played on a black cop basketball team. Like he mm-hmm. had a city league basketball team and I played on it. But the one experience that stands out to me is uh, we, we were messing with these girls and they, they were obviously white girls and we would always go over to their house and be Lower Park. playing around in Lower Park. And we we always be playing around in they in these big houses because that was always amazing to us. Like, yeah. oh my yeah, god, we didn't have nothing like um, that. Yeah, yeah, we we never experienced anything like that. It's like, wow, I'm in a I'm in a mansion, and 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 those things to them were normal, um, mm-hmm. regular stuff. And to us, mm-hmm. we're just trying to get another friend to come along and see it. I, I always had the connection with with the girls. So each one of my friends, I do you know. <laughs> uh, each one of my friends, they they being like in line, trying to come with me. Like each one of them, yeah. would, they would take turns and yeah. and and come with me to go <laughs> to this particular house. Well, yeah. while we were there, this person's dad came. We're stuck in this house upstairs in her house and we're in the closet. We're on the second floor, like we're in a two story. So this is, this is no lie. I'm telling y'all the truth. So me and my friends are in the closet and it's two of them with me. And I'm feeling responsible for these dudes because they, they came with me. She's coming to the closet and telling us who, like, okay, this person go, go, you know what I mean? And we had a sheet hanging out the window, but the sheet didn't go all the way to the <laughs> ground. So you, you had to, you had to shimmy down and then just drop. Like it, it was, it was a drop, a, a big drop. So I'm like, go, man, you go, you go. So I, I'm sitting there, I'm in the closet. Like it felt like three hours, but it probably Dang. was 35 minutes, you know, but it, it, it I mean, I'm trembling because all of them already, they are, my gone. two friends already got out, they gone. So she finally came up there and she was like, okay, go, go, go. So I, I'm, I run to the window and I get to the window. And as soon as I got to the window, I saw his face and he looked at me and he's, he called me a, a F and yeah. N word. And, yeah. and I just dropped, I just let go from the windowsill. And I mean, my feet was running before I even hit the ground. Like I was so scared. I was like, this man is going to kill me. Like I, I just knew he was going to kill me. So as soon as I hit the ground, I just, I ran and I never stopped running until I got home. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I was so scared. And that was the last time we even heard from her. They shipped her away to family and things like that. That's the only experience I really had with, because I never saw that. I, I was always, I was the first person in the neighborhood that had a white girlfriend and mm-hmm. I didn't care. I did not mm-hmm. care. I didn't see, I didn't see things like that. And I was like, I like yeah. who I like, but I didn't, yeah. I didn't know, like people would say, man, what are you doing? They would say that yeah. to me in our community. You, you Who's remember how you? they, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 like the yeah. but the girls. Yeah. It was the it, the, it was. Yeah, I was about to say it was. Yeah, it was the girls. Yeah, yeah, they were they they were like I was like, well, you don't like me, right? Exactly. So what, you, what, what are you upset about? So yeah. Um, but that stuff was, I was kind of oblivious to it, except mm-hmm. for you know sparing 
experiences. It wasn't until I got older. Yeah. Uh, the one time coming through Laurel Park, I guess that's Laurel Park. I was cutting through. This one I used to work at Athens. Coming home on a bike to go home. I cut through. I guess you could say it was their yard. It was like a street, but it was the side of the house. But it's not like I was right up beside their house. I was riding a bike right on through. And when I came through, it was two dudes on the porch. They cussed me out, called me the N-word and everything. And all I did, this is how you know it's like cowardice, too. I'm still the same height, man. I'm 5'6". I ain't grew no bigger. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I stopped the bike. I turned around, put the bike down. I just looked at them and I said, we all say? And then the dude just stood. He looked like he was a tall dude. He looked like he, I mean, he just standing on the porch and just looked at me. He ain't saying nothing else. I said, I thought so. And then I drove off. I mean, I don't know what I would have did if he would have said something. I just was just trying to see if they was going to repeat what they said. Yeah. You, you, you rolled oh, off. You didn't drove. Yeah, rolled yeah. You, no, you I rolled off. Yeah. 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 We didn't up. have yeah, no yeah, cause. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, we sure didn't. We, we, sure didn't. we didn't have no cause. <laughs> but that's funny. You say, like, so my wife loves to go out to eat. And I don't mind. We go out to eat. You know what I'm saying? I'm not really big on it. But she, that's just how she does, right? And I tell her, I say, you know, when, when I was little, we coming up in Charleston, boy, only rich people go out to eat. Like like how you be talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the rich people go out to the restaurant. That's how we see it. They're like, we got, you know, we got, you know, you got the refrigerator there yeah, side by side with the ice bake and all that. I said, yeah. man, boy, I said, this makes me That's... feel like I done did something. I said, we ain't but never I'm, had nothing. I'm like accomplished. This I'm, you know I'm accomplished. <laughs> you know? Now, now was, was, I, was I rich folk? Was yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You had a you so had a basic, house, ba- man. Yeah. So basically, middle class white people were the rich people. Us. Yeah. To right. us, no, that's yeah. right. That, no, right. that was yeah. Um, yeah. That was high society. Like, um, yes, sir. We used to we used to just walk through Laura Park and and, and call houses. We used to call yeah. a house. Like, that's like, my house. That's, my house. house. that's yeah. that's my house. And and yeah. and we would <laughs> argue. We would argue that's about my house. That. No, like I see that, that house first. No, I saw that house first, and then we we would be tell him, "Hi, didn't I say it yeah. first? Like, remember yeah. last yeah. week like, when yeah. we were like, I ain't hear you say that. I ain't been here. I ain't hear you say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. argue, <laughs> but argue. Yeah, we would we would get upset about that. And, yeah, and man, that was argue. and and trick or treating like that was the uh, the spot. Y'all like give we out, would y'all give out the candy. Yeah. 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 Y'all give you, out the candy. You trick or treat. Yeah. So if you there, trick or treat in our neighborhood, you don't get nothing. Like everybody yeah. turn their light off on purpose. Yeah. Like the yeah. the light off. Don't knock on. They leave a lead on the door. <laughs> don't knock on my door. Yeah. My yeah. my child yeah. sleeping. Um, yeah. So we get our bikes, put on our backpack, and ride through Lower Park. Lower Park. Yeah. Come home with now, a bag full of candy or two. Now was was this was this rare? Did you guys see uh, guys like Clyde and Clark who lived in my neighborhood? Were they not? I know y'all connected with them. They weren't different from y'all, but did y'all see their living situation as drastically different? That he was in my neighborhood. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I I didn't. It's crazy, man. How just Joey? Like how you specify like middle class. Uh, the to us that was that was well upper class yeah yeah that yeah. was God. the finer things in life I mean what yeah did 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 y'all go to like the country club next to the golf course out in Harbor View I mean did y'all uh, oh no, no absolutely no, no, no. And, and is that because the distance or because y'all get in trouble being out there no well we we yeah. never even we weren't mm-hmm. exposed to that type of lifestyle yeah. Yeah. you know what I'm saying yeah. okay. like they, yeah. That's that's a whole different experience. Now that right. I play golf and yeah. I'm yeah. always at the country club showing my face because I can play, yeah. you know. Yeah. But um, there you go, wow! <laughs> and I got a low change in my pocket. Yeah. So when y'all are when y'all are hanging out with with me, are y'all like in the back part? I, I, it's not on the forefront, but if you thought about it, would you be like, man, he's lucky? Like that'd be that'd be nice to have his setup or you're not having those sorts of thoughts. I mean, no, I, I, I mean, I did, I did. Yeah. Go ahead, I, yeah. Just, okay. So like, like, okay, let's look at like Nintendo. How many Nintendo games you had? Wally and Clyde would come borrow them. I'll tell you that. Exactly. That's, that's <laughs> exactly. End, of story. End, of story. end of story. You, you, yes. you, <laughs> was the, you was the GameStop. 
Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is just perfect because anytime the door knocked and it was just Wally by himself, we knew what he was there for. We we would bring the big old box. Hey, which one are you? <laughs> yeah. See, we we yeah. then. We would always go to with Billy, like when we got in high school. Um, I don't yeah. know if y'all remember, like Billy, we would go to Billy house and they had like this big house on the lake, um, yeah. tennis court. I mean, this is wow. a part of their house. Um, they yeah. had all of these water toys and things like that. Like, oh my. And they, they would, they welcomed us in their house. Like we were their own. Billy, Billy McQueenie. He, he only, he came oh. to James Island the the final year and he played oh, he I came just to play basketball with us yeah um yeah but oh, oh he was we, a transfer for basketball yeah he he transferred from um it was a, a Mont Pleasant not Mont Pleasant oh. they stayed on on John's Island I think but he was in a private school that? and his, his, his dad his dad knew the governor and like wow. it was he pulled all kind of strings to get Billy and James Allen. And Ooh. because we just knew we were going to the championship, but Billy exposed us to a lot of things and we would always go to his house and, yeah. and be in it, like just in a, a mansion all the time. And it's like, man, look at this. They're so yeah. lucky. And yeah. like uh, just being in amazing and in awe of what they yeah. had, but, Growing up with this person as your friend, you recognize like it wasn't that different. The only different was the class they were in. They still had yeah. family trouble. Yeah. They still had family issues. And right. yeah. the same thing like us, just on a different class. So you picked up on that as a kid. It's like they're just living differently. They got the same problems. They're just they're as jacked up as anybody. Well, yeah, I picked up on that early because of how my mind is. Like yeah. I've, I've always been analytical like i'm i'm analyzing things and i'm wondering mm -hmm. why this is this way as a kid yeah. like why that is that why that is mm -hmm. that and so but i didn't i didn't put in the the race thing um because i was always connected to white people in some kind of way yeah yeah me and too me I, too oh i was always connected to them so i never put it into that perspective until I right. started paying attention to politics and, and yeah. how the Come world was experience. running. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Something ain't right here. And no. that's when I start putting things together. Y'all thinking in your heads, like what was the attraction to also have white friends or it just so happened that they were people that you liked. Yo! Are you a comic book fan, an MCU fanatic, or a self-described pop culture buff? Then you're my kind of people. My name is Botter, and I'm the host of the comic podcast, The Short Box, a.k.a. the best comic podcast this side of the multiverse. And since 2012, I've explored a wide spectrum of comics and pop culture topics alongside some lifelong friends. So regardless if you're a comic know-it-all or a new fan thanks to the movies, The Short Box Nation welcomes all. Tune in and join us every Wednesday for in-depth comic spotlights, interviews with the best comic creators in the industry and entertainment recommendations worthy of your time now tune in and check it out for yourself peace okay so for me i was cool with whoever was cool with me so yeah in class some of my classes i might have been the minority in the class some other classes you know some of the white folks might have been a minority in that class but i'm trying to be cool with everybody in the class you know what i mean so Whoever I I connected with, I was cool with. It doesn't matter, you know, race, sex, none of that. It just if you was yeah. cool, you was cool. So yeah, that's just how I always been. You know what I mean? But um, it wasn't a yeah. I'm gonna just try to be cool with some more white people. It wasn't a thought to me, a conscious right. thought. It was right. just like, hey, they they cool, they cool, just like uh, you know all my other people I know over here, my black friends. So I can be right. cool with them too. So if whoever is cool with me, I'm be cool with them. And that's just the yeah. way I operate. Yeah. Do you do y'all think that this innocence that it sounds like we all shared is a good thing? Because I, I I do, but then I'm the white guy here. You know what I'm saying? Well, well, That's what I, I was gonna say. To a point. Yeah. Go ahead, I sorry. think Go ahead, I think I think it protected our our innocence and our childhood. 
Um, yeah. And, and it, it, it allowed us to develop like a healthy, um, because we shared so many memories where it's not tainted with some, like we have to go out and point in, in and say, yeah. Oh, this was that during that. But I, I mean, I appreciate the way I was brought up. I appreciate yeah. all of the friends that I had. And I never saw it as a white or black thing. Uh, people yeah. around me did to a certain degree. It was sprinkled in there. But for mm-hmm. me, I was always a bigger. I wanted everything. I wanted all of everything. It didn't it didn't yeah. matter to me. Um, like I would try to make the entire class laugh. I didn't care yeah. who was laughing. <laughs> I just wanted every, I wanted to see smiles on everybody's face. That That's you, what moved me. You know, People's I still see Silver Bells, like you made it up. I think it was in middle school. Uh, There's a little sound yeah. effect you used to make. <laughs> flanker, flanker, flanker. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You're right. You're right. I, right, I, I bells like that. <laughs> hey, I used to tell him I, I used to kill like that um chorus class. <laughs> yeah, man. Or every every song, it, and it got to the point where the teacher would cue me. Like she would be like, "Okay, story, remix that." Like he every added- every song, I I had I added something in there, and yeah. everybody was so happy singing it. It, yeah. it brought it made it it different. We weren't robotic in there because I was like, yeah. "Nah, we gotta we gotta put some yeah. life into this." Yeah, and you did and, that. You and, did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You it, it was always it was always a good thing when you walked into your class for the first day and stories in there. It's like, all right, that's gonna be pretty good. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good to know. Because I was, I was always, oh, God, come on, <laughs> tell him, tell him, Mike, Joey, you, you weren't experiencing in, in any of that, but man, I used the to bus rock them boy. buses. I, I mean, <laughs> Zinni used to kick me off the bus because before my stop, I'd be like, this is not even my stop. She says, Lias, she used to call me by my granddaddy name. She said, get off my bus right she now. And, yeah, she it would was call like, me by my grand. <laughs> it was like walking into a comedy club because everybody would yeah. sit down and turn around in their seat and just, just watch just the for just to see and what I, he's going to do. I'd go, man. I'd be, I'd be cutting <laughs> up. I was cutting up, man. For every real. Day. Oh every day gosh. was a new experience. When when, when I walked, uh, Zini would be like, oh, Lord, here we go. And she <laughs> she would she would hope I would miss the bus, but she really didn't. She she no. loved me, but that was she, she would hold yeah. up a stick. Yeah, she said, yeah. I got this stick for you today. You need to get there and shut up. <laughs> go back there and shut up, man. <laughs> I was going to say with him doing that, though, it kept everybody in line because ain't nobody cutting up because we all just watching him joke and we just laughing and, yeah, you yeah, know, standing yeah, outside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was her ally. She just didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did did your did your parents and 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 forgive me because I don't recall y'all's guardian situation and, and who you lived with. But were you guys instructed or educated as to what to do? Because this was a surprise for me just 10 years ago when I found out that my peers were taught, hey, when you get pulled over by a cop, you do this, you don't do this, you do this, you do this, you'll be okay. Like, I didn't know that was a thing that black families had to teach their sons is and and I don't know if that was something that was normal on on James Island, but that is that something that your guardians walked y'all through? Well, we didn't have cars, you know, no, coming so, up. So gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. That's a big difference. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there's my white privilege right there. Well, I mean, obviously, you guys are driving cars, so <laughs> we definitely. Um... I was rich. I didn't know, guys. I didn't know. <laughs> Really rich. You were, you were. We didn't even. You were rich. We didn't even know what wealthy meant. We yeah. we didn't learn about wealthy until later on. But you were always yeah. rich. But no. um, yeah, but yeah. I I I learned about the experiences of some of my friends that when when I got older, like they would say, they would always turn on the lights, all the lights in the car, put their hand on the dash. They, yeah. um, it was just, uh, an experience. I never encountered. Um, yeah. And I, and I think I owe that to where that little nest egg on James Island that we grew up on. Um, yeah. 
again, like the we had black police officers that policed our neighborhoods. And we we very seldom saw a white police officer. I, I, yeah. I mean, honestly, like unless that's you too, hype. Yeah, that's true. Like even when it, it was almost like they were assigned to our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, that's cool. Because we we would see the same cops for when things got heated or it, it was it was just the connection was with the cops. Like my one of the cops were was going with my sister. But was in a relationship with my sister and I was in a relationship with a cop's niece. So it, it was, it, I, I didn't, I didn't experience the things that are going on right now, but I've had no. some friends tell me about their experiences and now I see it on a broader scale, you know? Yeah. Yep. All right. So let's move into some territory. We've got maybe four or five more questions. And now this is kind of not reflecting on the past as much as we're grown ass men now looking at our present day and age. And there's just a lot to look at and a lot to assess. Do y'all think that our kids, and I don't know the age of y'all's kids, mine, uh, my oldest is 16, my youngest is 10, I have two in between, but they're definitely growing up in a completely different world. They're in public schools, just like I was, but obviously the woke culture, the cancel culture, it feels as if we're making some great gains as far as racism is certainly not acceptable. I mean, body shaming is not acceptable and uh, homophobia is not acceptable. All these great gains of accepting and loving people. Obviously, the cancel stuff, I think, is a little out of hand. But in general, from a rate like the the race, the racial reconciliation and all of that, do you all think that our kids are growing up in a better situation than we did yeah um because like you said the racism isn't as the vitriol is the same like it was not even like when we was little and we didn't catch like the heat of it you know what i mean so it's still out there but it's it's not like 60s 70s racist like you know out in public like that i don't think from that aspect you can say it's it's better for them. some more opportunities that you know we possibly didn't have that's available for them But the thing I'm more interested in is the education part of how we got here. Because I feel like that's a big block that needs to be brought to the forefront. So, for one, people can understand why this whole racism thing is the way it is. Two, why some things that are still in place are in place and need to be taken down, changed, broken, whatever you want to say. And three just so some understanding can be brought out so people can know why the black community feels or has felt or is in the condition that it is in right now. Cause there's a lot of stuff that I'm learning that was never taught, you know, in, and we grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina was one of the hubs for slavery for slaves coming into the country initially. And there's a lot of stuff around there that I didn't even know. It's like, Oh man, you said that's what that was. That's what this is. Like, uh, you know that policing started in uh, South Carolina and it started as a way to catch slaves, catch runaway slaves. It was like a duty thing. Um, I think at the market or something, downtown. The the market, that was the actual slave market. That was actually a slave market. I used to play, you know, I used to live downtown. I used to play there all the time, bro. I used to go there all the time. The reason why they got those historic walls up in Charleston, all the walls looking all... Nice and, you know, with the with the iron in them. Well, because Denmark Vesey and some other slaves had planned uh, a slave revolt. They said they had already, this was reports, so you never know because it never actually happened. They had supposedly had like 5,000 slaves or something like that ready to revolt, ready to go run and do whatever they got to do. But somebody told the plans and then they went, got Denmark Vesey and the other co-conspirators, cut their heads off, put them on pikes down the road, and then slaves used to be allowed to have essentially like a hall pass. And they could just run to walk through the town freely. You just show them what, why you had to go where you had to go. Like if the mass sent them to go get some eggs and milk or something, they could just do that, right? But the town was just an open area, you know, stores here, stores there, whatever. They said after that, 
they put the walls up so it wouldn't be easy for slaves to be able to just run across the streets and run across through towns. They can corner them easily and things like that. It's a lot of things that, like I said, I'm discovering that right. it's like, man, I was right there and all this historic stuff and nobody ever knew. I used to catch the bus. I don't know if you know this, Joey. I used to actually live downtown Charleston. I think I told you that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I had family on James Island. I used to use their address and that's how I used to go to school on James Island. Now, gotcha. because the James Island was a well-funded school. They were one of the better schools in the area. I live, literally, I can walk out my front step and look in one direction and see Burke High School. Wow. That's how close I lived to Burke High School, but Burke wasn't one of them funded schools. It's all black yeah. school. Wasn't, wasn't getting the funding. My mom th thought the education wasn't good. Neither was any of the middle schools or anything like that downtown. So right. we moved from James Island to downtown when I was like five, six years old. But right. she wanted me to continue my education on James Island. So we used the family member's address on James Island. Gotcha. But, gotcha. but yeah, man, it's like all the stuff I'm just, I'm discovering as I was, like I was about to say, the Wapoo Bridge. Right. Come across the Wapoo Bridge. I don't know. They said, somebody told me that that, that fire station that used to be right there is now a historic site because it was graves or whatever, right? Well, it's right. that field right there, too, that when you first come on James Island from that bridge, I used to always see this little hut. And I used to be like, what the heck is that? Like, why yeah. is a little hut, you know, out of out of the ways down there? And it's actually historic. It's the old slave quarters. Yep. And I'm like, this whole time I've been going to school, nobody never told me that, like, that's a historic landmark. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. So, so I think the education piece is a big piece that needs to be brought more to the forefront, you know, and then I think that if fully embraced, fully accepted, and actually, because there's a lot of stuff, man, I'm finding out it's a lot of, like, ill stuff that happens, you know what I mean? Yeah. If a lot of that stuff is brought out, then maybe people will start to understand and start to really get more into this whole get rid of racism type stuff, yeah. you know? be on page yeah. with it and actually yeah, yeah. I, I i just i really i truly don't understand when white people don't acknowledge systemic racism like i just don't get it i i don't know if y'all remember latoya jones but her and i uh go to church together and then her mom was my admin for a really long time and so we would talk all the time in the office and she told me this and i was like wait come again say did you just say what i thought you said so she's my mom you know latoya's mom is my mom's age she wasn't allowed at folly beach when she was a little girl, when she wow. was a little girl, she could not go to Folly Beach. That about blew my mind. And I'm thinking, how 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 do white people not see that when we're talking just one generation ago wasn't allowed at a beach? You don't get to just wash your hands and say, hey, well, well, everything's fine now. So all that mm -hmm. stuff doesn't matter. It's fine yeah. now. Not acknowledging. All go ahead. That's it. And the easiest way I can equate that is if you have a child, right, and I'm equating the life of the, the community to the lifespan of like a child, let's say, and they're abused as a child, right, and they grow up, and as they grow up, their life is dysfunctional or, you know, it's not quite the way what we consider to be normal. They have issues and all this stuff going on, and then you ask them what happened, and you find out they had... uh abuse they were abused as a child you don't say well that was a child when you were a child get over it you know, just grow up you don't you don't do that they have to have counseling <laughs> you know they have to have all this stuff you know and people have you know understand you know and it, 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 there's a process there to get them through that to help them come through and begin to heal and so when mm -hmm. people say like yeah it's fine now uh all that was in the past just moving forward it's like it's not that simple because so much right. stuff done got messed up from then till now, that even though things are better now in a lot of ways, it's still a lot of stuff that's messed up, even at this point, because of how messed up stuff was back then. Right. Even even my parents' ability and ease to make more money than what your parents were able to. I mean, just as a as a common rule of thumb, I I'm you know, my grandparents, when they died and and left their property to my parents and they sold it, that was a huge chunk of chain because it was property on James Island. I would imagine oh, yeah. a lot of my black 
friends that they, they're never in that situation. I mean, I don't know. Never. And, 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 um, well, when you say about our kids, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you talk about our kids, like, um, the, the way that I look at it, you, Joey, I don't know if you know, but I, I had my first child at 15 years old. Gotcha. So, um, my, my oldest son, um, he's in, the I, I don't even want to mess the acronym up, the LG, uh, B, yeah. just let the people. Yeah. Let yeah. People. I don't even, I don't even want to say that cause I don't want to offend anybody or anything <laughs> like that. And, um, <laughs> but I had the privilege to, to bring, I had all boys, you know? Mm-hmm. So I had, I had all my boys with me for a certain period of time. And I felt like that was my time to, to give them all of me, um, all of what I had to instill it inside of them. But I could, I can see early on that I had four different boys, you know what I mean? Like personalities, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. character traits and things like that. So they all needed a certain thing that I needed to implant, implant in them a certain message and lesson that I needed to give to them specifically for who God was showing me what kind of person they were. And, um, so looking back on my childhood compared to their childhood, like my father was never there. Like I had to take trips downtown to, his uh, record shop, Joey, just to give you an idea of how most uh, black parents were single parents if, in some some kind of way. And the dad was in the street or in jail. And mm-hmm. so the system, we, we came up not really having a father that was our father. We always had father figures that were around for a little while. And then you... Yeah. You, you were exposed to their messed up behavior or their, their type of way of doing things, knowing that they weren't really connected to you because you're not their child. You, right. They just want to be, be with your mama for a little while and um, absorbing all of those things and then trying to give the exact message, a better message to your kids while you're raising your kids, being exposed to all the lies that you were taught in, in education and in the schools mm-hmm. and things like that, it was such a, it was so much to deal with. I, I feel like privileged people didn't have to deal with. There's more we have to sort through in order to, to even give a message to our kids. So mm-hmm. it, for me, I, I built a base. I built a base for my kids and the, and the, it, it surrounded them just making sure that they were real, making sure that they were mm-hmm. their authentic self. And, and mm-hmm. as long as they were being that and doing that, I said, God will make sure everything that every environment that you're in, you're able to influence it and you're in the right place because you're being who you are. And that, that helped my son come out and yeah. say, daddy, I'm, he's like, daddy, I'm gay. And and uh, mm-hmm. the interaction when when it happened, I knew it since he was ten. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Like he wasn't yeah. he wasn't giving me any information that I didn't know. But it's right. just all of the things we have to sort through when we when we teaching our kids and bringing them up. The time when it happened, we it couldn't even be a an experience that was a uh, warm. It wasn't even right. a warm experience because too much other stuff was going on. We had conflict and dysfunction and all of these things going on. So it, it that's the things that I think about for my kids. But I made sure they all had a their, their father there at everything. So m- none of my kids ever felt like their daddy wasn't there um, because of what I felt. I used it as a tool to fuel me to be more present as opposed mm-hmm. to something to go in the, the other direction. So when you look, when I look at it like that, I can't get upset with that. It, it, I can, I can change. I want to change it, but it's hard to be upset with it because I was so prevalent in my kid's life. 
But as far as being better or worse, I think they have way more things to process and deal with than I had to deal with because we were so oblivious to they're they're so exposed now to so many things. So we 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 have to pick and choose the races pockets that and yeah. then hear experience from our parents like, oh, for real, you had to go through that. And but they're exposed to everything they're exposed mm-hmm. and and it's it's getting worse now as yeah, far as exposure yeah. is so yeah. that's why i think they have more on their plate we did a lot more with less mm-hmm. and they're doing a lot less with more if that makes yeah. sense yeah statistically is your generation turning things around with the absent father thing? I don't, I don't know. Oh, let me, let me get on that one. I, I do feel like we're not turning it around as far as family go. We're turning it around as fathers go. Okay. We're not, we're not getting out to our kid's mom and making them our wife. And, and we're not doing that, but we're I tried. being present and, yeah. Well, yeah, you, you're, you're an anomaly. <laughs> you're an anomaly. <laughs> so you remember, so the, you remember the girl Valerie I was with? Yep, I do. I eventually married her, went in the military and we had two kids. There's only two biological kids I got that marriage dissolved. And then now, so, but yeah, I've been in their they, they, uh, lives my whole life. I mean, their whole life. Yeah. But I think the family concept for the traditional family concept we're not changing that around because it's no. so much exposure going on to other things right now in this world like this. It's it's just wide open. I feel like everything is just wide open. So yeah. but we are. I got two points to make and then I'll yeah. shut up. We are being more present in our kids lives. I think the fact that we have to say that like it's a badge like no, yeah, like the fact that we have to say that, like that's something. Like, look what An I'm achievement. doing. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, it 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 speaks to how messed up bad it was. Yeah, uh, how dysfunctional it was. Like, that's what we supposed to be doing. And the fact that we're 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 taking a badge to get to supposed to that that speaks to how far we are behind mm-hmm. in that in that aspect you see what i'm saying joey like yeah. it, it yeah. we're sprinting to get to the starting block we're sprinting to get to the starting block and y'all they mm-hmm. already shot the gun you know what i'm yeah. saying and we yeah. gotta we started. gotta go yeah. yeah the race already started and we're we have to sprint up just to get to the starting block so mm-hmm. it until it, it, we just need a complete overhaul and and everything or or we're going to keep fighting the same fight it it, the system if it doesn't get rearranged we're going to keep fighting the same fight it's just going to be about different issues tell me how you would feel if this was your situation and then i'm gonna say what i want to say about like what story said the system just imagine you're walking home from school yeah with your kids uh, your other friends or you know you're a kid you look up and see this person walking and it's your dad out of the blue. You're like, hey, what's going on? Hey, you happy to see him? And at the time, I didn't realize it. It's like I realized it, but I blocked it out because I think about it now. And I'm like, yeah, I did catch that, but I was ignoring it. It's kind of like his demeanor was like, thank you. You know what I mean? Like, you caught he, me kind of. Yeah. Just, like, oh, nah, shoot, I, I didn't bad. mean. Yeah. And he walked me home. Well, he walked me to the to the, over there where we was at to the uh, on James Island on the project. And then kind of went about his way, I guess. Gave me like a dollar. And then that was it. That's that's what we talking about. The same man who later on to me told me one night he got drunk. Like Stoy said, he made a concerted effort to change it. He was the reason why I did that. Okay, so he told me uh, he got drunk one night, got real high, whatever, and called his dad and cussed him out for like not being there for him and this and this and that. And I'm sitting there thinking, so you telling me that you called your dad and cussed him out for the same thing you've been doing to me my whole life? You know what I mean? <laughs> and this man has yep. never lived more than I thought about it once I came to Georgia. He's never lived more than like, except for the time when he was in the military, I think he said he was in California. And then when I moved up here, 
I moved up here with him to get like a fresh start on life after I got out of the military. My mom said he had called and asked me to move in. But to be honest with you, it wasn't even about me. He had an agenda. I'm going to just say that. I found out. I was like, wow. So that even it's not even like he was trying to help me out. He did that because he had another reason behind it. So I used that, though, as fuel because I'm like, I'm not going to do my kids like that. Meanwhile, well, my, like I said, I got a divorce. My kids in South Carolina. I'm in Georgia. I got to go to court just to get visitation rights. The setup so I can come and see them in the summertime, you know, every other Thanksgiving, Christmas, what, all of that stuff. I got to drive to South Carolina to see them. They got to come up here for the summertime, whatever. I got to do all of this and I'm on child support. And then no, she ain't doing right with the money, but that's a whole nother thing. I'm going to get to that in a second. While this man, they never lived more than 15 minutes away from me, even here in Georgia. He never lived more than 15 minutes away from me, but doesn't lift a finger to call, doesn't even bother to swing this way or nothing like that. And I'm like, I ain't no way I'm going to do my kids like that. So I never did. The thing to me is, if the end result for this child support thing, because we, the, the, I, it's, it's set up really to destroy the family, the whole welfare system. If the end result is you just want the father figure to be able to provide financial income, financial means, whatever, to the mother and the children, child, whatever, why don't you just do that? The man has gainful employment. And instead of letting him keep his job, you lock him up. Child still needs to be taken care of. They still need money, right? Because that's what you you saying. You need money, right? So you lock him up. He loses his job because you got him locked up anywhere between six months to a year minimum. Because uh, I forgot what they call it. It's a charge. It's like there's no real time frame on when you get locked up for child support. I don't know if y'all know that. There's no real time frame. I never been locked up for child support. Well, I, 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 I'm I sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I, I, I never. Not saying I haven't been um, dealing with the system with child support, but um, I never been locked up for it. Um, yeah. But my experience with my dad, like I will, I remember this. I, I was 31 years old, and mm-hmm. I was talking to my dad, and I said, "Look, man, I think it's about time. It's been long enough." Because my dad had his own family. So me, we had other siblings. This this right. is typical, yeah. this is typical yeah. bl- black family. So I, I know I'm not saying anything new. Yeah, I want <laughs> Joey to, to get a, an idea of the layers that we're dealing with. So my dad yeah. had an entire family. So mm-hmm. I have siblings that I've never met. What I said to him, I was like, hey. I think it's about time now. Like, I think it's about time me and my sister meet our other brothers and sisters. Like, you, you've been carrying this lie. So me and my sister was like a secret. It's, it's time now, man. I'm, I'm 31. What my daddy said to me was, Stoy, you always trying to stir things up. Just, just leave well enough alone. And <laughs> this, this was the same person that told me when I when I was like, hey, daddy, I, I, I need some money. I'm trying to buy my girlfriend a ring. And this was the same guy that told me, you should never ask another man to buy you, give you money to buy a ring for your girlfriend. I'm like 12. I was like 12 or 13. And he was also activist. He went to the Million Man March. He's he, all of these things that He's bragging on, like getting that badge. But then when it's time to own up to his shortcomings, he wasn't strong enough to do that. So those are the those are the type of men that were built. They were they came up in that system. So Mm -hmm. I had to get I had to gain an understanding of that because it, it put me in rage because I knew what kind of man I was. So yeah. instead of getting mad at him, um, oh, I was mad. So to finish my story, I said, I think it's about time. And I, he was like, "Story, you always stirring things up. And I said, well, you're obviously, it's done been 30. My sister was 34 at the time. I was 31. And I was, I was like, you obviously don't see and you don't plan to change this. So I'm going to change it. So I, I came, I flew home, and me and my sister went to his house. His wife didn't know anything about us or anything like that. 
Me and my sister pulled up to his house. His wife came out to, I, I had already called my daddy and told him we were going there. I said, this, I'm not, this ain't going to stop because you, you're trying to scare me. We pulled up to his house and his wife greeted us outside, mind you. She was like, who put y'all up to this? Like, oh. did y'all did y'all hear that our anniversary was last night? We don't have any money for y'all. Like, oh, like wow. that's that's how she greeted us. So my sister immediately goes into tears. And I'm like, no, I got to man up. I got to defend my family, defend my sister mm -hmm. here. And I was like, mm -hmm. no, miss, this, we didn't hear anything about your anniversary. We're not here for no handout. We don't, we, that's, that's not why we're here. We, we, I'm just tired of us being somebody's secret and being treated like we're not worthy or uh, we don't because of a mistake. It's just a mistake. Uh, own up to mm -hmm. it and we move on. So my daddy pulls up. So when, when, when my daddy pulls up and they had like a, one of those roundabout um, driveways. Mm -hmm. So my daddy pulls up in between me and my sister and his wife. He pulls up. He gets out of his van. He looks at me straight in my eyes. And he said, I told you not to come here. Like he whispered it to me. Yeah. He whispered, I told you not to come here. And I said, I told you I was coming. Like I, <laughs> I whispered back to him. Yeah. Like I told you I was coming. He, he walks around, takes his wife in the house, shuts his, his protector guard doors and shut oh, his wow. house door. Me and oh, my wow. sister just standing out there. And I said, Rena, don't cry. Like I told my sister, don't cry. I said, yeah. he, he, he's going he gonna to come back out here and he's going to own this. And so we stood out there for about 15 minutes. And yeah. my daddy and his wife came back outside. And the first thing my daddy said to me was, who told you I was your daddy? Oh, my gosh. I said, are you serious? I said, are you serious right now? He said, yeah, who, who, who told you, where did you get that from? And then at that point I was in rage because I'm like, mm -hmm. this man is a straight up coward. And, and I yeah. said, there's no way I came from you. There's no way I came from you, bro. And I said, you told me that, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I mm -hmm. went, I went at him. It was respect yeah. and all of that was out the door. So yeah. we stood there. I don't want to draw this on because I've already gone. My daddy since passed away and he just passed away last year. We haven't spoke since that day. We yeah. haven't spoke since that day because I, I couldn't, I couldn't live in his lie anymore. I couldn't be mm -hmm. a part of it unless he was owning it. But that's the kind of men that were built from that generation before yeah. us. Yeah. Not all men was like that, but that was a no. normal thing for mm -hmm. them to be running the streets, um, mm -hmm. having two and three families, having kids mm -hmm. out of wedlock, having kids mm -hmm. that was all around the place. So mm -hmm. that that kind of nature of not knowing or having the, the proper guidance on how to raise a family, how to all I knew was I wasn't going to be like my dad. Period. Yeah, that's, that's all I did. Hey, just don't. I, do I wasn't gonna be like him. Yeah. So yeah. I I yeah. I used it as fuel, but there was mm -hmm. still resentment there, and yeah. and and that resentment, um, I try to distance that from my kids. But you can't if you're being all the way who you are, and you're communicating what's in you, it's gonna come out in some kind of way. So yeah. I don't know exactly how I impacted my kids in a negative way. But I knew that resentment for my dad was inside of the things that I did because I'm I'm so I embody who I am. I'm coming 100 percent all the time. There is no abbreviation to story. I know my kids had to be impacted by that in some kind of way. So I'm I'm using that to try to be better now, you know, to mm. be the best person now. That's tough to hear. And that's a a crushing thing to endure. I mean, Stoy, I think it was you and I mean, 
the craziest memories, but I remember we picked you and Tyrone up from the school to take y'all to Charleston day for a game. And I'm just assuming, mm-hmm. I mean, in y'all's mind, you're like his dad and his mom picked them. Yeah. yeah. Like, we didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. We didn't, yeah. we didn't know that, that like that, that was foreign to see yeah. your mom. Like we just assumed that was your stepdad. Like oh, wow. we, we, we're, we're not thinking that's, that can't be your real dad. Would you? Oh wow, that carries on, and it and it hurts. It hits. I wouldn't right. say yeah. hurt. It hits mm-hmm. at a different level because I. I mean, I don't look at it like I'm some basket case, or I don't. I don't yeah. even see it like that. I. I find the silver lining in everything, but I mm-hmm. can't escape the fact that I had some resentment, and I. I. I was. Um. I was upset and and hurt to a certain degree mm-hmm. by the way that he addressed me, like I was a, a straight up foreigner. Yeah. And yeah. that's what developed from the system right. that we're under. Right. So Stoy, the first place that my wife and I moved into where we, when we started having children, our neighbors, the whole time we saw their two little girls grow up Well, a, a, near the end of our time there. So this is probably five years ago, her and I are talking and she's like, well, I mean, you know, I used to date Stoy, right? <laughs> I was like, what did you just say? She's like, well, I mean, I, I was at high school and I was a Stoy's girlfriend. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. But uh, Melissa Silva, <laughs> Stoy's like, why you got to say her name? <laughs> I, I can edit that. But I was like, oh, yeah. my gosh. <laughs> no, I don't. You don't have to edit it. Like, um yeah. I want to say I remember her. I mean, obviously we look totally different, but I want to say I remember y'all two together. But when Melissa first came to our school, she wasn't yeah. there long. Yeah. Like she she came in, I think she was there for like one year. Her her impact on on the school was ridiculous. Like everybody was talking about this girl. Like I I didn't even I all I did was hear. I just heard like this murmur. Like, man, did you see this new girl? Did you see this new girl? Did you see this new girl? And she she had them long curly hair with the low glasses. And, I and the glasses get me the glasses get me every time. Her her cousin is, <laughs> is Shannon Sears. Shannon Sears uh, is her okay. cousin. But okay. she came from Ohio. I walked into my class, like I I done heard this for like three periods. And then she was in like my sixth period class or something like towards the end of the day. And when she walked in there, I said, that's her right there. And I, and I, as <laughs> soon as she sat down, y- y'all don't understand how story was. Soon as she sat down, I pulled my chair right next. <laughs> I pull up a chair right next to her. And I said, girl, you are beautiful. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe how pretty that girl was. I like wish she I had was that confidence back in the day, man. Oh my gosh, to have that confidence in high school, man. Oh yeah, I I was a problem, but um, yeah. He, he yeah, helped she, me out a couple of times too. I don't know if you know. I sure that. did. But, I, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I I remember. No more wolves in the sheep's clothing. Nah, not at the doors crack, kick it open. Yeah. We know that change is rapidly approaching. Went from roping and choking the eyes wide open. We can see those demons. And they still scheming. We're not believing. And we're not leaving. No. I said, we're not leaving the end of your season for so many reasons. Things were not even. We're struggling hard for something to believe in. Kind of-